everybody. This is Kyle from Data Skeptic. I'm going to go over a talk that I usually give when I'm asked to present like a lightning talk or a fill-in or something. Just a quick 10 or 15 minutes. Not that technical, but something that I think most data scientists should be more familiar with. And that's Goodhart's Law. So let's get into the formal definition here. Goodhart's Law says, roughly, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. And this is my attempt here to visualize that a little bit. Think of this as some function we're trying to optimize, right? But as we get close to the peak optimal position, we start getting a lot of just sort of stochastic noise. Well, what does that look like in principle? Well, think of something like the FICO score, you know, how we rate the creditworthiness of people, at least here in the United States. It's obviously quite desirable to have a high credit rating. So when you find out what components go into that calculation, you might like to manipulate them. For example, me. There's a credit card company I won't ever do business with again because they did something that I'm pretty sure is illegal, but I don't have the time to file up, and basically they screwed me over. Never going to do business with them again. However, I'm aware that part of my FICO score is calculated by the history of accounts that I've had open. So while my instinct is to cancel it and let them know I'll never do business with them again, I'm actually just keeping that card in a drawer and making them send me statements because I know it boosts my credit rating and a behavior which is quite natural for me to do, cancel that card, could adversely affect it. So I'm altering my behavior as a result of an algorithm I know is in play. This is a chart that tells the story of the first time I actually encountered this. I was working for a small company that was really heavy on sales. In fact, I collaborated closely with a lot of the sales teams and one of their managers. And this isn't how the pay scale worked, but roughly speaking, it was something like this. You know, salespeople got a base pay, plus some variable commission described below. So monthly, if their total sales were under 50K, 3% commission, this range 5, over 100K, they got 7% commission, something like this, some scheme. Now this turned over every month, and the one manager that overlooked all the sales team was constantly frustrated with what he described as the hockey stick effect, that you know, you'd have a certain amount of revenue booked, and then in the last couple days of the month, suddenly there'd be all these bookings of revenue. And his perspective on this was, oh, those salespeople, they're just trying to get over the next hump, you know, maybe if you've got 90K in sales you and, and the end of the month is approaching, you call up your customers, give them a little push, maybe even offer them a discount they didn't need to have been offered since the sales reps of this company were given some relatively generous ability to discount items when they thought that would help close the deal. And in those last few days, maybe they would over-discount in a way that doesn't benefit the company as much, but benefits them because the commission is booked before the end of the month, earning them the higher commission percentage. This is another example of people altering their behavior and doing things differently because you set an optimization target. All right, what about more broadly? Another great example I like is the spam filtering arms race. As people who do spam filtering continue to improve on their skills, they're going to filter out more and more spam. Yet for people who find it profitable in some way to send spam, they need to go up their game then, find ways around that filter. And then of course the filters have to turn around and compete again. And until such time as the difficulty in getting around a spam filter is greater than the cost of finding the way around, we're going to continue to see this fight. Although I think, you know, in my lifetime, this has changed tremendously. In the last 15 years, machine learning has won the problem of spam. What about search engine ranking? You can hear a lot of good advice from people and a lot of bad advice. In fact, I think more bad advice about how to do SEO properly and what really matters. And we all know that incoming links matter a lot. So, of course, something that happened as soon as PageRank was introduced into the landscape was people started doing link share trading. So sites that otherwise might not necessarily link to one another were agreeing to link backwards and forwards to each other in order to assist on their mutual search engine ranking. Now, of course, there are aspects of information retrieval that study this phenomenon and how to counteract it. But they only had to do that as a result of Goodhart's law coming into play here and getting people trying to manipulate their search engine results. All right, this third one I think Snopes needs to work on at some point because I'm pretty sure this is a myth, but originally it was reported and I've never seen it verified or reproduced, but the claim was that if you clear your cookies after searching for airlines and then search again, you'll get better prices. It's entirely plausible. That is technologically possible, not hard to implement. The question is, are airfare websites using that tactic? I don't know. But nonetheless, many people are now clearing their cookies because they're thinking that can earn them better prices somehow. Whether it's true or not, their behavior is changing. They're manipulating a metric. This is the example I already shared of me keeping a credit card in a drawer for no good reason, except to manipulate my FICO score. Retail discounting and couponing strategies. This is the one that I think is the most damaging to a couple of companies. You know, if you send out a nice discount or a coupon to customers, often that'll bring in some new immediate business. 
Why not, right? Some people were in the market and now they've got a coupon that motivates them to spend. Other people may have been on the fence, but hey, as long as there's the coupon here, we'll go take a look, maybe buy something. So just about every campaign like this where you discount something is gonna get some amount of results. And if you don't know how to read those results correctly, it can come off something like a drug addiction. You know, you wanna go and push that button as many times as you can and keep getting those bumps in sales. And if the management of the company doesn't recognize what's going on, they're just going to appreciate those bumps in revenue they keep seeing. But the reality is the more you discount and coupon, the more your customers come to expect that, the more they visit Retail Me Not and similar sites, and the more they trade codes and potentially even worst case of all, they can delay purchases because they're gonna wait for a better price that they assume is coming because the company discounts so much. So as the company tries to optimize for revenue through their discounting strategy, their customers start to optimize for discount. Last but not least, bidding in ad tech marketplaces, especially first price auctions, and auction mechanisms where most people are bidding like flat constant rates or there aren't a lot of people participating, there tends to be a lot of room for saving money by manipulating the bids you put in. I know this goes on tremendously in display ads. Now, of course, anyone working in machine learning ought to be doing cross-validation for all the normal reasons. You should be doing this anyways, but I think this is part of how we start to understand Goodhart's Law, but it doesn't tell us the whole story. You know, if you don't understand this concept of Goodhart's Law, it might seem like cross-validation is the full solution. Your holdout set should tell you if you're overfitting or if there's some aspect of the system you're not seeing. However, you can only do cross-validation on historical data, data you already have. You can't really look at what's going to happen with data in the future. So if you calculate a model based on historic data, that model, by definition, didn't exist at the time the data was measured. So if you now deploy that model to some production environment, customers or users or visitors of a site, whoever's interacting with it, may start altering their behavior and therefore altering the training set, thus potentially invalidating or weakening that model. So why would a model's results in a production environment be different from the training examples? Well, I like to think that's in three cases. First, it's due to overfitting. That's the obvious one. Secondly, due to incomplete training, when you either don't have enough examples in your training set, or I think more commonly, you have a limited training set that doesn't really reflect the full system you're running in the so-called real world. So one example might be training your data on only US-based visitors and assuming that's going to apply internationally or something like that. But lastly, and perhaps most importantly, certainly for this talk, there's some deviation to Goodhart's law. The results your model achieved on training data may not generalize because the actual system you deploy the model into may end up changing as a result of the model's presence. So here's one helpful trick that I want to recommend that may be useful to you in testing for Goodhart's Law. I've got this uh, old miles per gallon data set that everyone's pretty familiar with. It's built into SKLearn data sets. I think it's in the UCI machine learning repository as well. The first set of columns should be familiar to most people who've looked at this data set. The last one I added, I just made up fictitious created dates of when this data was collected. So now what you might be trying to predict in machine learning is something like the miles per gallon. How do the number of cylinders in the car, the horsepower, the weight, and all of these other features contribute to the miles per gallon that car achieved? That's a nice machine learning problem. But I'm challenging you to solve a different problem. Add a column or include the column of the time at which the data was created. Now make that your objective function or some version of that, maybe trim by year or whatever else is relevant, or block it into time periods like quarters or months or who knows what. Depends on your data. And then see if the features you have available are useful in predicting the date they were created. If so, then by definition, your data is evolving through time. The results are changing and when it was recorded is sort of embedded in the input set. If you're able to make a reasonably good prediction of when the data was created, and assuming there's no leakage involved, but if you can do that, then you know the system you're describing is evolving. And therefore, one would assume that newer data is more predictive of the future than older data, for starters, but also, you expect your models to constantly drift and go out of date. What do I mean by drift? Let's look at the left side here first. This is our original fit. Blue dots are our data. We come along, we do some very simple regression here, come up with the red line that represents our regression. We can now use that to make uh, predictions about the future, which might be helpful to us. Now what happens a year later when we collect more data and then we decide to go back and refit our model? Maybe we get the red model we saw previously in black here and a new model refit in red. Why aren't the models the same? If we have a good prediction of a system, every model should more or less predict the same results. Well, here we get a difference because the data has fundamentally changed. Now one option is that our original training data was incomplete in some way, or not large enough to really optimize to the best parameters. 
But as I've drawn it here, it's more likely that Goodhart's law is in play. Something about the business has changed, and we need to build a new model to reflect that. Now, it could also be that that change is just systematic. It has nothing to do with Goodhart's law per se. If your model is not impacting the experience of your users, then it's probably not Goodhart's law. This could reflect just changing market conditions. But to some degree, if the model is altering that system, it's likely to cause drift. Well, you've got to keep an eye on drift and look at it from several sources. This fictitious plot I've done here is a theoretical release, I would call it a botched release, of some software application. We have a time series looking at, at the response of an API, and it was, on average, giving us about a 30 millisecond response time. And then suddenly, at time 600, whenever that was, we saw an immediate plateaued release. I've seen a lot of systems that behave like this when some code is released to a production system that either wasn't tested well enough or the testing couldn't adequately simulate what would happen in their production system. And this is the nature of software errors. You jump in big plateaus. However, a data scientist releasing a model of some kind is more likely to see drift along these lines, something subtle. You know, you slightly change the way you're doing recommendations or sorting offers or pricing goods. Many people are not going to change their behavior. They're working with the system in a predictable way that they're used to. Now, of course, if you double your prices overnight, you're going to see a big plateau. But if you raise your prices by 3% overnight, only a minority of people are going to see exactly that and complain. Even those that don't like it will take time to find a new vendor. But market forces may kick in over time and just say people end up buying less because they find that the costs are just adding up over time too quickly. This is the type of drift I find when machine learning models are deployed that exhibit Goodhart's law in some way. So how do we deal with Goodhart's law? I believe detection is key. You must be vigilant about monitoring and having the right metrics that can tell you if this is happening. I think experimentation is also heavily required. You can't be afraid to release models or make changes. A failure to act is a failure to innovate. To be successful, you need agile methods for model deployment. In most situations I've been in, when I'm helping a company, I work towards an environment where we can do continuous deployments anytime we want. Now, we do those in an A-B test fashion, but I want there to be no friction between me and pushing out some experiment or some experimental version of a model. So causal impact is one interesting tool. I did a whole episode of Data Skeptic on this. I recommend you guys go back into the archives and listen to. We go into details there, but at a high level, Causal impact uses historical data to make some predictions, and at the time some intervention happens, or some change, or like a model release, help you estimate the impact of that model release, or that change, which more or less arrives at the difference between what actually happened and what was forecasted to have happened without the intervention. Now, Goodhart's law also can manifest as what I call a self-fulfilling prophecy. And you've really got to be aware of this. Think of something like lead qualification. You work for a company that has people filling out a form at a website, and you get more submissions than the sales team can quickly respond to. So you have to make predictions about the leads that are going to close and prioritize those, or maybe route them to the agents most likely to close. Now, as soon as you start acting on that model and prioritizing those leads to those customers, or those leads to individual sales reps, this can quickly become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, if your model is just guessing at random, then in theory, nothing should change. The reps are all randomly selecting from a pool of incoming leads as they did before. However, if your prioritization gives any advantage over random guessing whatsoever, then you should see a lift in the close rate. Those salespeople will either close more or be faster in closing those deals. And because they're prioritizing them, if time to response has any value, it will manifest very quickly. And those that were therefore deprioritized, put to the ends of queues, may suffer from that delay, whereas otherwise they could have been closed. So if your model perfectly predicts that system, then you've got an optimal ordering. But if your model is only just doing okay, like a B minus average, then you'll demonstrate the value, and the model may get into a situation where it's not able to learn the more complex system that's there to be described. If you prioritize based on the B minus model, counterexamples that could get you into the A minus range might never occur. This can be fought with maybe a bit of randomness, so prioritize 80% of the results based on these predictions you're making and 20% based on just random population or experimental populations. You will never win against Goodhart's law. It's just going to be an ongoing battle. So if you fear you're going to face it, fast iteration is really the key. The software lifecycle, SWLC, these days most companies tend to do that in like a two-week sprint. So there's going to be a software release every two weeks. We need to consider what do we actually mean when we say some system a data scientist is going to control. Typically, that's like a microservice, but it could be an embedded library or any number of other ways that some sort of middleware is set up. My recommendation here is that you have to separate the actual software from the model itself. 
the model should be serialized in some way if possible, or at the very least, you should be able to remotely control its state updates and do parameter tuning on it. If you have a simple parameter that you need to experiment with, putting it in a config file might mean that there's a change management person who's going to get in the way of you doing experiments. If instead that's some software configuration controlled through an interface that you are able to use, even in a browser or wherever, then there shouldn't be any real contest here. Now, that is a production system, so you could get pushback, but the argument should be that if there's concern about that parameter being changed, the quality assurance team should be able to do whatever they want to test the changing of the parameter or its configurations, run any simulations you'd like, to make sure the software doesn't fail on a change. And for any reasonable company, that should alleviate the question. You've got to be able to run experiments, and that path has to be cleared. Another important point in the topic of Goodhart's Law is being able to give explanatory powers to your model. Often, Goodhart's Law is only going to show up, at least initially, in some small subset. You know, raise your prices. Some people will defect immediately. Most people won't even notice, but might recognize at the end of the month that their pocketbook's a little bit lighter and start making changes. If your model is interpretable, you can look at how it's changing, what it's valuing. Sometimes you are fortunate enough to get interpretable models, like this one here, that make a great deal of intuitive sense, and anyone in the business can appreciate them. Decision trees are often heralded for their interpretability for this reason. However, when you get a decision tree that looks like this, I'm really not quite clear on how interpretable that's going to be. But anyway, if interpretability is your issue, I'd recommend a paper called Why Should I Trust You? I interviewed the lead author on Data Skeptic a while back. You should check out that episode as well. They're developing some tools that are really interesting about making individual use cases that are interesting, finding some local region of the model and describing that. I won't go into the details here because you can listen to that episode, but this is a very useful tool. It's helping us in situations where model interpretability is a problem. If you have an uninterpretable model, you're a little bit more at risk for Goodhart's Law. If you have an interpretable model, you can ask questions about logically how has it been evolving, and that might give you some insight into the fact that you're experiencing a change as a result of the model itself. So in summary, Goodhart's Law once again, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Businesses set KPIs, key performance indicators, all the time. Employees get their bonuses and salaries tied to it. Therefore, they're definitely going to want that KPI to be as high as possible. If it's truly measuring the success of the business, that's great. If it's measuring a quasi-success or a proxy for success, then you might end up incentivizing your employees to optimize a little bit left of center, actually. Goodhart's Law is really important in that way. As a data scientist, if your work is at all meaningful, you will encounter it. What do I mean by that? Well, if your work isn't meaningful, no one's going to make any decisions based on it. If there are decisions being made based on it, maybe your model even manifests as some microservice in a production environment that's getting tens of thousands of calls a minute, each one of those is an important decision that's going to impact the results of that company or organization, and then the people interacting with it may change their behavior. That's a meaningful integration and one that's at risk of being affected by Goodhart's Law. There's no magic solution. You've got to try and measure it in your data. I think work on explanatory models will help to mitigate this. And my last bit of advice, don't let your average case blind you. Even if some deployment increased some metric by a little bit, look at the tails and see if Goodhart's Law is in effect there. All right, I hope you enjoyed these quick thoughts. If you've got any comments on Goodhart's Law, please share them with me. I'd love to hear your anecdotes or stories. Maybe we'll even do another extended episode of Data Skeptic if people want to share their thoughts. I'd love for you to send me a wave or MP3 file telling your story of an encounter with Goodhart's Law. You can find me at dataskeptic.com or on Twitter at dataskeptic. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab.